Um, to be blunt, Pamela is a big deal in the animal law. Um, she is currently a professor at Lewis and Clark Law School. She has so many accomplishments there. She created the Center for Animal Law Studies. Basically, it's an academic program which serves to help the future lawyers of animal law. So it's a big deal. Pamela was the first ever appointed dean of the animal law program. She did that from 2010 until 2020, in addition to teaching. Um, further, she's also the co-author of the premier animal law textbook that's used across universities across the country. Um, I definitely think we all need to advocate to get that into our school. So, Pamela previously served as general counsel for the Animal Legal Defense Fund itself. She created um, the ALDF Criminal Justice Program. So that's kind of part of what our speech is going to be about today, how all laws, animal law, that program specifically worked with law enforcement to help advocate, investigate, and even prosecute um, animal abuse and animal neglect cases. So big deal, contributed so much. We're so thankful to have you. Um, and this is Pamela's first time being in the state of Arkansas. So oh. we're very <laughs> excited to have her here and most importantly in our community and on our campus. So please give a warm welcome for Ms. Pamela. Oh Thank you so much. It really is wonderful to be here. And um, let me just open up my computer here. I, as Bailey said, this is my very first time to Arkansas. Look at the state and what a beautiful campus you all have here. So thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm, it's such a pleasure to be here. And I do want to thank Bailey Geller, the University of Arkansas Animal Legal Defense Fund Board, Linda Lloyd, and of course, our generous donors, <coughs> Dolores and Christopher, who support this event. And I understand so much more. Thank you. Um, you've all given me such a warm invitation. And it really is wonderful um, that I get to be here. So thank you. So let us begin. Oops, let's see, why is this not, should be working. Can I do that? Uh-oh. That's on me. That's on you. <laughs> well, while we're doing that, I do have, let's see. Oh. Yay, there we go. Okay, before we get started, I would like to take, take an informal poll. So by a show of hands, how many of you here have a So, how many have dogs? Yeah, cats? Okay, birds? Fish? Other command animals? Gerbils, hamsters, anything like that? Yeah. Okay. Well, everybody has a companion animal. And I, full disclosure, I myself am a dog person. So, um, on the left, I'm at a Beijing dog shelter meeting some of the dogs who were rescued from a booty trade and who I would accompany back to the States for adoption. And on the right is Max, who is a survivor from a puppy mill case that I worked on back when I was at ALDF. And um, Max is now 16 years old and is thriving, which is kind of unbelievable. So speaking of thriving, I will say that in this presentation, you will only see pictures of happy and healthy animals. Um, we so often deal with really disturbing images of animal abuse, and although it's really important to bear witness and become knowledgeable about the many ways in which animals are suffering, I also think it's important to remember why we're doing this work. To remember that we aspire to create a world in which all animals are flourishing as they are in the photos that you're going to see. So, now, we've talked about our companion animals, so now I have another question. How many of you here Think of your companion animals as a member of your family. Okay, great. Okay, good, good. All right, so I'm getting to know you. And now that we're all friends, I'm going to ask you a more personal question. If you were stranded on a deserted island, how many of you here would prefer to have your companion animal there over a human family member or friend? <laughs> okay, all right. Well, let me tell you, you are not alone. Studies show that at least 57% of people say that they would want a companion animal as their only companion if they were deserted on an island. And some other fun statistics about companion animals, 79% give their companion animals holiday or birthday presents. Guilty. 62% often sign letters or cards from themselves and their companion animals. 
<laughs> guilty. So, so it's interesting how much we just love our animals and how much we think of them, especially our companion animals, as our as our family. So I think that we can see that in this room, and probably in most rooms, at least in the United States, people care about animals, maybe not all animals, but at least some animals. And it is that care for animals that leads some of us to a career in So <coughs> a common question that I get is, OK, what is animal law? So in a nutshell, it's really any case or law in which the interests or welfare of an animal is at issue. So let's take an example. And the example is going to involve the same basic facts, but just a couple of little differences in this. So let's say that we have a racehorse, and we are going to shift the racehorse to go run in a race. Well, the carrier who is shipping the racehorse has some problems. The racehorse gets to the race late, can't race. The horse is fine, but the owner is out of money that he or she might have won if the horse had run. So now they might have a case against shipper, but it's a pretty straightforward contract case. It has nothing to do with the welfare of the horse. So, you know, that's a contract case. It's not an animal case. All right, same scenario. We've got a racehorse, the shipper shipping the racehorse, but in transit, the horse gets injured. And now the horse can no longer run the race because the horse is injured. The owner is distraught because they love their horse, in addition to probably losing money. Now, because the welfare of that animal is at issue now, so based on that example, you can probably guess that animal law frequently intersects with most other traditional areas of law. And it's just that people don't know that they're actually practicing animal law. So here, um, I want to tell you a little story. I was once sitting next to now retired Supreme Court Justice Jeff Anthony Kennedy at a luncheon at Lewis and Clark Law School. So we're sitting next to each other, and he turns to me and he says, oh, so what do you teach? I said, animal law. And he said, oh, I don't know anything about animal law. And that was a moment of a little bit of awkwardness for me because I had to gently remind the Supreme Court Justice that actually, Justice Kennedy, you were the author in one of the most famous animal law Supreme Court cases. <laughs> <laughs> the Hialeah case you know, involving, I don't know if you know the Hialeah case, but this was a case involving uh, Santorin religion down in Florida who were sacrificing animals. They wanted to build a temple, and the city council said, no, 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 we're going to pass all these ordinances saying you can't do that. The Supreme Court said, you know what, we understand that ostensibly you're saying you're doing this because you don't want the animal cruelty, but really you're just trying to say we don't want this religion, so it's not going to fly. But they talked a lot about the importance of trying to reduce animal cruelty. It was some, so they were saying that, you know, that's a fine motive, but that's not what was going on here. So I had to, so, you know, I'm talking to Justice Kennedy about this. I'm like, oh, yeah. And here was the amazing thing. He then turned to me and said, you know, before I became a judge, I was in private practice. And I was representing a woman in a divorce case against her husband who had been abusing her and their horse. I was able to bring evidence of the horse abuse into the case to resolve the matter in her favor. And he said to me, I guess I've been practicing animal law. And I said, you have. That's okay. <laughs> now you can, you know, we are the same person here, right? So, uh, so it was it was interesting because he just started to, I mean, I'm not, I don't suggest anything that Justice Kennedy is thinking or not thinking, but it was interesting for him to, in that moment, see it through a different lens. And that was exciting. I think that's an experience that's really common for so many people in this field. So, you know, some people say that all law is tax law, but what do we say? All law is animal, animal law. That's right. All law is animal law. So uh, whether it be criminal law or constitutional law, administrative law, torts, property law, or any other traditional area of law, animals have been the subject of cases for many, many, many hundreds of years. It's just only in the last 40 years or so that the field has been recognized as a distinct area for advocacy, scholarship, and education. So I'm going to just talk about a few examples of how you might be thinking about animal law in some of these more traditional areas. And maybe some of these types of cases have come up in your own law school classes, in your traditional law school classes. So let's take contracts. I talked about the horse example, but another much more common example is 
in the landlord tenant context. So let's say that your tenant, you sign a lease, the lease says you can have a dog up to 20 pounds, you bring in Rover, Rover weighs 19 pounds, but then Rover has a good appetite, suddenly Rover is 25 pounds. Are you breaching your contract? What happens? What rights do the landlord have to require you to move out? What rights do you have to protect your animal? I mean, suddenly it becomes this really interesting contract space. What about wills and trusts? So all 50 states now have a provision, normally through the Uniform Trust Act or through the Uniform Probate Act, but some unusual ones as well, where if after you die, you can make sure that you have a provision to take care of your animal for the rest of his or her life. That didn't used to exist, but now it does in all 50 states, torts. Let's say that you have a cat, the cat keeps going over into the neighbor's yard and disturbing the plants, maybe using the yard as a bathroom, your neighbor is upset, so your neighbor goes out and leaves some poisoned meat, your cat eats the meat, your cat dies, you are distraught, it's horrible, if the cat suffered, well, maybe you can sue under tort law for intentional infliction of emotional distress, or maybe for loss of companionship, depending upon the jurisdiction. Environmental law. In, in endangered species, well, the ESA all of a sudden comes into play. Or in the context of CAFOs, which are concentrated animal feeding operations, so big factory farms are sometimes called, you've got Clean Water and Clean Air Act laws that you can use to the advantage of the animals. Constitutional law, so I talked about the Hialeah case, but you know, it, it arises in all sorts of different contexts. One, one issue that I'm working on right now, that I'm writing about right now, looks at the issue of what protections exist for artists to use animals in creating their art in a way that harms them either psychologically or physically. And this interest for me really arose because of a matter involving the Guggenheim Museum a few years ago. They brought in this exhibit from China called Theater of the Poor. And as, I think there were something like 70 or 71 pieces of art, including installation art. And there were three pieces in particular that caused a lot of people a lot of one of them was a videotape, and it showed two pit bulls side by side with a board between them. They were on treadmills, and they had scars on their faces. It was clear that they had been used for dog fighting. And they were on the treadmill, which is a common training tool for fighting dogs. And so they turned the treadmill on, and they started running. And then all of a sudden, they removed the board, and the dogs were lunging at each other. And they couldn't quite reach each other, but you could tell that the, the psychological stress and harm on them was palpable. You could see it on their faces. That was one of the exhibits. Another exhibit was an installation exhibit. They had this big sort of circular enclosed structure, and inside the structure they had all sorts of insects and lizards and other small creatures. Some of them were predators, some of them were prey. There was no chance of escape. And then the, the museum goers could just watch them, the predators go after the prey, the prey having no opportunity to escape. And then the third one was a photograph involving a very large sow who appeared to have, be, have her entire body tattooed with nonsensical Chinese characters. So if indeed that was what was happening, you know that there was a lot of pain and suffering that happened in that. So so activists learned about this, and they became very, very upset. And they started picketing the Guggenheim. They started threatening, which, you know, threatening the board, the executive director. Finally, the, the museum took down the exhibits. But it was not until after a lot of artists and people in the community, everybody started to really weigh in. It was interesting, because Ai Weiwei, I don't know if you know who Ai Weiwei is. He's a very famous artist. China, and he's actually a patron of some humane societies, so he loves animals, he cares about them. But he came out publicly and said something to the effect of, no, 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 we have to allow artists to have free expression and, and have it be unfettered. And I thought my perspective was, you know, that's an interesting cognitive dissonance, and it's one that I think a lot of us share, that sometimes we think about protections for certain animals, not for other animals. We think that some activity here is okay, but not there. But it really sparked my interest in terms of, okay, so what, what does the First Amendment say about that? Well, how far can we go with that? 
so you can see that animals in animal law it just arises in virtually every single context within traditional laws the other thing that's really interesting is is to think about which animals are covered when we think about animal law well you know not surprisingly um and i think as we all know all animals are potentially covered but it depends on how the animal is defined. That's when I teach the, our fundamentals, the very first you know, animal law 101, the very first day, I do a slideshow of all these different types of, what I think of as being animals, and maybe not animals, and I do a poll. It's like, okay, so is this horse an animal? Show of hands, and everybody's like, is an animal. Is this mouse an animal? Is an animal. And then I go through and say, actually, it kind of depends. Um, and one of my favorite examples to use is the mouse. So let's think about the mouse for a moment. If you have a mouse that you have as a companion animal, in many jurisdictions, the anti-cruelty laws will apply. So that mouse gets a decent amount of protection, as much protection as a dog or a cat in your home. If that mouse is a pest, you have an infestation of mice, you can kill that mouse any way you want. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter how cruel, nothing's gonna happen. If that mouse is an endangered species, well then yeah, the ESA comes into play, some pretty good protections. If that mouse, if that mouse is in a research facility, so the Animal Welfare Act is a federal law, which is the principal law that, that regulates animal testing, dog fighting issues, breeding for research, you know, a few other things. Under the Animal Welfare Act, birds, rights, birds, rats, and mice are not even considered animals even though they comprise about 95% of the animals that are being used in research. So, you know, if you're a mouse of research, there are some other laws, the Public Health Service Act and other things. But under the Animal Welfare Act, you have zero protection. If you're, if you're a mouse being used in entertainment, for movies, or commercials, there are going to be contracts but that say you're going to be treated humanely, but who's actually overseeing it? Overseeing it is are they being overseen appropriately? Are there appropriate penalties? And in all of those contexts, we're talking about the same, the same individual mouse. So it's just the human lens, the human context that really makes such a difference. So when we think about animal law and we think about animals, we always have to look at the definitions first. And just you know, for fun, I thought, well, I'll look at Oregon, Oregon, because that's where I live. Our definition, I'll look at Arkansas. Let's see what it says. So in Oregon, animal means any non-human mammal, bird, reptile, amphibian. And of course, there are other sub definitions depending upon different contexts, but these are like the main. In Arkansas, animal means any living vertebrate creature except human beings and fish. That's Arkansas Code Section 5 62 102, sub 2. If you want to look it up. Um, and I thought that's pretty, we've got a pretty good definition of animal, so that's, a really, that's, that's wonderful. But every single state, of course, the definition completely changes. Um, and it, makes a huge difference in terms of what protections apply. So the, the title of this presentation is Why Animal Law Matters. And rather than wait until the end for the big reveal, let's just talk about it right now. Animal law matters because animals matter. We know that they're sentient. We know that they can feel pain and psychological distress. And they are integrated into virtually every part of our lives. It's the food that many of us eat, we wear, the research they're part of, there are companion animals, the wildlife we like to preserve. Animal parts are used in paint, carpet fibers, wine production. We are literally surrounded by animals in our lives. And given that none of them signed up for the ways that we use them, I think that we owe them our best efforts to reduce their suffering and indeed support conditions which allow them to thrive. But I want to say that there is another important why animal law matters, and it has to do with the intersectionality of species, race, and gender. So you might ask yourself, what does the exploitation of animals have to do with human oppression? Well, everything, according to a number of scholars who think deeply about these issues. And two of the most influential in this space are Silco and Avco, they're sisters, and uh, they've written a lot, but their, their seminal book is Afroism, Essays on Pop Culture, Feminism, and Black veganism from two sisters, and it provides this paradigm.
paradigm shifting perspective on the entanglements of race and species and gender. So Ath has written that animal, when you think about the category of animal, it is a category where we shove non-human animals, but we also sh shove a lot of humans into that category when we want to justify violence against them. Like, oh, they're just an animal, right? They're just a wild beast. Think about animals and humans in the same category when we are exploiting them or when we are justifying violence against them. So the human-animal divide is sort of this ideological bedrock underlying the framework of white supremacy, they would argue. So this negative notion of the animal is the anchor of this system. And what Afroism argues is that dismantling the human-animal binary is essential to taking down systems of domination that oppress anyone who falls outside of the ideal human body. And that decentering whiteness is a pathway to animal liberation. And it's a really interesting theory that they've come up with. And in other words, advocating for both animal rights and anti-racism anti only strengthens now, what's especially powerful about activism is that it does go beyond just critical analysis. It, it actually also proposes a solution. So if you're interested in this at all, you want to delve a little bit more deeply into it, just check out, they have a, a website called Black Vegans Rock. It's this di uh, digital platform that spotlights the achievements of black vegans and really talks about some of these issues. Now, another scholar that you may have heard of who has explored the connection between animals and gender is Carol Adams. Um, she's the author and also of many books and articles, but is most well known for her classic sexual politics of meat. So her book, that book and much of her writing examines in great detail the connection between meat eating and misogyny. And she says that veganism actually challenges the patriarchy in that it rejects and dismantles meat eating because of undeniable parallels between the oppression of women and animals at the hands of man. So, so again, I think that if you're interested in these particular um, threads and these areas that some of these scholars have looked at deeply, I highly recommend these two books. They're, they're interesting. If nothing else, they'll be very thought-provoking and it'll help you really think about how you feel about this issue. So animal law, I've been involved in animal law for just 100 years. And so it's, it's really interesting to see how much it has grown and how much its relevance has really been gaining, gaining traction for many years. Um, and some of the reasons why it has become more relevant, I think, are on this screen. And so you know, I'm not going to read those. But what we are seeing is that more and more people are becoming invested in improving the laws to protect animals. And a great example of this kind of growth is to look at the evolution of state felony anti-cruelty laws. So, all right, so let's just do a quick overview because I know that um, you may have covered some of this in your criminal law uh, classes, but it, I don't believe that you have an animal law, a fundamental animal law case, so I'm just gonna do a quick overview so that everybody, we all are on the same page. So every state has multiple layers of anti-cruelty laws, most of which are misdemeanors. So the lower level laws go back hundreds of years and many of them contain some of the enumerated common categories and common which I'll show you on the next slide in a minute. But interesting fact, so in 1641, the Massachusetts Bay Colony created what is likely the very first animal protection law in what would become the United States later on, which is still a colony. It prohibited the prohibited bestiality, which is having any kind of sexual relationship at all with any kind of animals. And do you know what the, do you wanna know what the penalty was back then in 1641? <laughs> no, but no, I'm not sure they considered it. Yes. Yes, death to both the human perpetrator and the animal. It's like, wait a minute. It's like the animal did not consent to this. So yeah, so they, they were not joking around there. <laughs> That's what you say. So here are some of the common exemptions that you see in many laws, which again, it's just it's just a, another reminder of the uh, how the human context really, really matters. It's like, okay, you know, we'll be nice to our dogs and cats, but you know, we can still do all these other things and it's going to be just fine. 
And it's interesting when you think about like farming practices, it usually says something like good has reacts or common farming practices without defining what that means. So it's open to tremendous interpretations you can imagine. Although interestingly, I think because of that, you rarely see a case being prosecuted that involves farmed animals or anything other than the animals. At least that was my experience. All right, so, um, so significant anti-cruelty law enhancements have occurred though over the last 30 years. Why is this happening? Well, you know, we don't know for sure, but you know, a couple of slides back when I said, when I had those reasons for the increased animal law relevance, I think maybe some of the same reasons uh, apply here. But what's interesting is to think about in 1993, only seven states had a felony level anti-cruelty law. And as you can see, those include California, Montana, Oklahoma, Wisconsin, Florida, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. So just for context, because I know that some of you were not even alive in 1993. Um, I just thought this is some of the things that are going that were going on. So Time magazine asked, "Can animals think?" This was the cover story. The conclusion in the in the story is yes, but apparently in 1993, which to me doesn't seem that long ago, <laughs> that answer was shocking enough to make it onto the cover of a major national news magazine. Also, in 1993, there was the first march on Washington that focused exclusively on animal testing, particularly in the production of cosmetics. So today, it's almost unthinkable that you couldn't find cruelty-free cosmetics, but back then, it was the body shop. That was pretty much it. Oh, and by the way, yes, that yellow arrow is pointing at me, and I'd like to think I was ahead of the game in terms of sun protection. So, you know, there you go. Um, to my right, is Joyce Tischler, who was the founder of the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and that a lot of those weren't some of the original board members. So anyway. <laughs> so today, all, so getting back to the felony anti-cruelty law, as of today, all 50 states have at least one felony anti-cruelty law. And here's just a nice graphic showing all of the state animals of all 50 states, which I think is kind of interesting. So Oregon passed its recent its first felony anti-cruelty law in 1995. And here you can say, you can see the, the last remain, these are the last ones that got a felony anti-cruelty law. And I thought it was interesting because Arkansas was one of, was all, the second to the last one to actually uh, pass an anti-cruelty law with South Dakota being the final holdout and they passed theirs in 2014. And to be clear, these felony anti-cruelty laws, they address the worst of the worst of the worst types of so these are the types of crimes that if it was done against a human, it would be life imprisonment or even a capital punishment, depending upon where you are, law supply. Um, and here, they tend to be the lowest level felonies. So there, sometimes people make this argument, oh, you can't be protecting animals at the same level. It's like, no, well, that's not happening in any event. Just because they're both felonies doesn't mean that they're at the same level. So it's an interesting thing because how do we know whether these laws are actually any good? These felony laws or even the misdemeanor laws, any of them, how do we know that they're effective? How do we know that they're good? It's really hard to know, particularly given the fact that all 50 states have very different provisions. So when I was at ALDF, we started a project that we call state rankings. So the state rankings are, they, what they do is they look at every single state, it's done at the of the year, so the most recent version looks at the laws that were in effect ending December 31st, 2022. And by the way, this is the 17th consecutive year when this analysis has been done. Um, and so, as you can see, they look at various categories, they rank them in the top of the <coughs> tier, they identify the five best and five worst states. So, before I tell you, and if you've already seen this study, don't shout it out, let people guess. But before you, I show you the results, can you guess who is currently ranked? Number one in the US, you can just, just guess. There are no. California. No. Vermont. New York. No, no. Oregon. <laughs> no, I wish. <laughs> Vermont? No. Rhode Island? I'm sorry? Rhode Island? No. Some of, these, some of these are in the top five, as you're going to see. Massachusetts. Not number one. No. I'm from Minnesota. What about that Montana? Minnesota. No. All right, you ready to see the results? 
Maine. Oh, Maine. Maine is number one. So, but you see, Oregon's number three. I almost put Oregon in all caps for that. <laughs> um, it would be really sad if we weren't in the top five. But yeah, Maine is is really wonderful. So, so here are some typical examples of best state provisions. You can read those. I'm not going to read them for you. But it's that last bullet point that really puts Maine over the top. And by the way, Maine's been number one for the last few years. So CAP is the Courtroom Advocacy, Courtroom Animal Advocacy Project. And it's basically like a CASA for animals. So it court appointed representatives to go in and to really represent the best interests of the animals. And you know, Maine's done that. A couple of other jurisdictions have done that. But it's it's really innovative and it's really wonderful, and it really is looking to put the animals' interests front and center. So, all right, now we're going to go to the other end of the spectrum. Okay, all right, who's at the bottom? What are your guesses? <laughs> Arkansas. <laughs> no, no, Arkansas is not at the bottom. It is. A, I will say Arkansas is in the bottom third. It's at the top of the bottom third, but it is in the bottom third. This is Texas. Florida. Indiana. <laughs> no. Wisconsin. These are great. These are really good. I mean, most of these are at the bottom that you're saying. So, <laughs> yes, these are good guesses, but not the absolute bottom. Okay. okay. Yeah. You ready? Okay. New Mexico. New Mexico is at the bottom. Many of its laws are really outdated, and you can see a particular concern is the narrow definition of animals. So all sorts of animals are just simply unprotected. They also, their neglect statute is, it basically is, just says, you just have to provide necessary sustenance. What does that mean? You know, most states, they have a long list of what that means, what minimum care means. So New Mexico has some work to do, and unfortunately, New Mexico has been in that position for a little while as well. Um, so, uh, so it is really interesting to, to, to think about that and to think about how the laws differ so dramatically. One of the interesting things too is that since we started the rankings, um, it has really motivated some of the state legislatures to improve their laws. And so we've seen some movement um, among some of the states that have been at the very bottom, not so much with New Mexico in the last few years, but. But it, but it can be a really powerful tool. Nobody wants to be at the very bottom, right? So we've only been able to scratch the surface on the work that's being done and that needs to be done. And as you can imagine, we have a deep need for as many trained advocates as we can get. Um, the work is overwhelming, it's endless. And what became evident to me in the early 2000s is that we really needed a law center that could offer rigorous training and support to the emerging generations of animal law advocates. So there's only so much one person can do, but I also really believe in the power of one. We're going to talk about that in a little bit as well. So my thinking was, okay, there's me, and I'm doing this, that's nice, but what if we trained up this whole army of dozens or hundreds or thousands of advocates? Think of the work that could be done. So with that in mind, and with a really generous grant from a wonderful donor, we designed and then we launched the Center for Animal Law Studies at Boston Law School in the fall of 2008. So, Here's our law school. As you can see, I mean, it's very Oregon, isn't it? It's in a forest. Literally, it's in a, a state forest. Um, and it's very, it's a really beautiful environment in which to study animal law. And you are all very welcome to visit. I hope you can this next tour. Um, and this is our uh, mascot, uh, Pio, uh, in Newfoundland. I mean, we are Lewis and Clark. So I think that, of course, you know, this animal law program needs to be there. Now, I understand you have the Razorback, right? Yeah. Okay, so I think the Razorback also needs an animal law program. So, we do that. So, so, I feel so fortunate to be teaching animal law at Lewis and Clark. Teaching animal law anywhere is wonderful because we do have an administration, staff, faculty, student body that just gets it. They understand the importance of the field and is fully supportive of its growth. But it wasn't always that way. And here's the part where I just really want to talk, especially to students. It was how this all got started, really, was through environmental law students. Back in the early 90s, there we'd always had this wonderful environmental law program where there was a group of students who were particularly 
really interested in wildlife. And so they went and they talked to their environmental law professors and they said, hey, can we put on this conference um, half day, it's just going to focus on wildlife, and in fact, I think it looked on marine mammals in particular. And the environmental law professors said, yeah, all right, we're not going to give you any money, we're not going to help you with anything, but go ahead and do it. So they did, it was a half day, and now, 31 years later, the, it's the Animal Law Conference, which is now this three-day affair. Have any of you been to the Animal Law Conference? I mean, oh my gosh, really, you need to come. It's wonderful. It's just three days of hundreds of animal law advocates and students, and you get to meet all sorts of people. It's in the fall, and we, we uh, alternate between having it in Portland and then we take it on the road so that different people can get there more easily. We just had our 30th anniversary in Portland. This year, it's in October. I think it's the October 10th through 12th. And it's going to be in Los Angeles at the Biltmore Hotel. So it'd be wonderful if you could join us. I mean, it's, it's just a great event. They also started what was then the first Animal Law Journal, which is now in its 30th year of publication. And none of that would have happened. And they continue to just grow, grow, grow. I started teaching as an adjunct, their very first Animal Law class in 1998. And then just grew from there. And then, of course, in 2008, we started this in Law studies. So, um, and now what's kind of cool, and this is why I want, I really want to show you this next slide because this is, without the students, none of this would have been happened. This is just a partial listing of the animal law specific classes that we offer. We don't offer all of them every year <laughs> because that would be impossible, but we offer at least 18 every single year in the summer, and we offer them in rotation. And it's pretty cool. Um, when I started teaching in 1998, only nine law schools had an animal law class. Interesting, the very first animal law class was offered at Seton Hall in New York in 1977, which I think, I think it might have been a bit of a one-off, but I mean, most people don't know that. So, but when I started in 1998, only nine law schools had an animal law class, but today over 165 law schools, and just for perspective, there are about 288 accredited law schools. So you know, the vast majority of them offer at least one animal law class, but most of them offer one, sometimes two. Harvard now, I think, offers four. Yale, I think, has a couple. Um, USF has a couple. Michigan State University has a couple. George Washington has two or three. So it's still, you know, there's, there's so much opportunity for growth, and I would love to see the University of Arkansas offer an animal law specific class. That would be very, very exciting. Um, but what's interesting, I think, for a lot of law students is that they don't, they have no perspective or understanding of how new that phenomenon and that development is. Because in their minds, it's always been around. Animal law's always been around. And I sort of love that. I sort of love the fact that, of course, of course we have animal law. That's wonderful. What's also interesting is that the ideas that were once considered subversive to some even downright comical, are now viewed as quite mainstream. Here's an example of the sort of thing that we were always dealing with. Um, <laughs> many of us remember when it was very common to be greeted by other non-animal law attorneys by barking sounds or a few elephants. You know, I mean, just, it was a joke, right? It's not so much a joke anymore, which makes me really happy, which makes me happy. And the other thing that's kind of cool is that now, in addition to just having animal law at so many different law schools, we have an LLM program. So we have an LLM is an advanced law degree, and it's the only one in the world right now, but hopefully that won't always be the case. Hopefully there will be other animal law LLMs coming up. But, but we've been able to now um, welcome over 100 attorneys from 28 different countries into our LLM program, most of whom have become animal law pioneers in their home countries upon graduation because they're the very first person in that country to do animal law. So it's very, very exciting. And we did not want cost to be a barrier for to access for these really passionate, dedicated lawyers. So we've actually developed this, a pretty robust scholarship program, which is funded by donors to cover tuition, housing, meals, insurance, and related costs for new bars. Because when you have a student coming from certain countries, they simply do not have the resources. And so we don't want to saddle them with a lot of debt. We want them to go out and do the work and not have to worry about that. So, and also knowing that some of our international graduates return to an environment in which they may 
literally be, literally be the only attorney in the country focusing on animal law. We created the Global Ambassador Program, or GAP, in the fall of 2020 to provide financial micro grants to empower and support them as they cultivate animal law education and advocacy around the world. So I know that sometimes it can feel really isolating for those of us who are in this field. I, you know, sometimes when you talk about animal law with your friends and family, they just look at you like, it's very isolating sometimes. So it's good to know that actually we are everywhere, everywhere now, just all around the world, and we can always communicate with one another. And it's like this family, even though we're spread out. So don't ever hesitate to, to reach out. As I mentioned, I also believe very much in the, in the power of one. I mean, collectively, we can do so much, but I also believe in what one person can do. So I'd like to share a few examples with you of how some of our LA graduates are changing the world in their part of the world. So, Ever Chinoda, she founded Speak Out for Animals, a nonprofit that she launched when she was a student under the supervision of our professor, Russ Mead. She is the first ever animal law attorney in Zimbabwe and has conducted numerous trainings and events for attorneys, judges, and prosecutors on Zimbabwean animal law. She's now working on the first ever wildlife casebook and is teaching the first ever wildlife law class at the Zimbabwe University of Law School and is trying to so, again, amazing what she's able to do. Alice DiConcetto, she's from France. She graduated in 2016, um, ever graduated in 2017. Alice is one of the top experts now in EU animal law. And in March of last year, she founded Animal Law Europe, a Brussels based consultancy that provides animal law expertise to nonprofits. In addition, she teaches EU animal law at Sorbonne in Paris, and she's published a number of books on the subject. Exciting. Diego Plaza, he graduated in 2020, he's from Chile, and while he was an LLM student, he founded again under our, this, our supervisor, uh, the Center for Chilean Animal Law Studies, Centro de Estudios de Derecho Animal, uh, in Spanish, I'm sure not, not good Spanish, but I'm trying. <laughs> and it's the first center to specialize in Chilean animal law, and he's leading strategic litigation projects. But most impressively, he helped spearhead the Subjects, Not Objects campaign, which uh, several months ago successfully included language that recognizes the sentience of animals in the new Chilean national constitution. This is uh, Kira Jalil. She graduated in 2020. She's from Pakistan. She's the only attorney in Pakistan to currently have an LLM, although that's going to change soon because we have a student right now, another second student who's going to graduate in May. She's writing the first ever comprehensive Pakistani animal law textbook. She dropped, drafted a model animal rights act for the province of Sindh. She drafted rules under the Punjab Animal Health Act and an animal welfare act for the province of Punjab. She's also working as a teaching fellow for us this academic year, which is very exciting. Lusha Gay is from Kazakhstan, and she's a 2020 grad. She co-founded the Institute of Animal Law of Asia along with another one of our LLM grads, See How You of China. And she's launched the Kazakhstan Animal Law Research Center that serves as an educational platform for students, advocates, and policymakers. She helped to write and draft the national law on the responsible treatment of animals, which the government of Kazakhstan is currently discussing, which is amazing. Gladys Kamasanyu, she's from Uganda. She is now the chief magistrate of the Ugandan Wildlife Court, which is Africa's first and only specialized as chief magistrate, she has successfully adjudicated over many high-profile wildlife cases involving elephant ivory, pangolin scales, live pangolins, rhino horns, and hippopotamus teeth. In addition to being chief magistrate, she's the founder and CEO of Health and Gathering of Animals. Again, something that she founded when she was at Lucy Clark. And she's creating a compendium of all animal protection laws in Uganda to make available to advocates and public advocates. So you can just see, just within a few years, what what can be done when you are passionate and motivated and you just want to make a difference. So I've talked about the last 30 years or so. Here's our, our palate cleansing picture of just happy animals. Um, we've talked about the last 30 years or so and how we've seen such a dramatic change in the felony act of the integrity law. So I hope that 30 years from now, scholars will look back to this time as the moment when animal law began to gain widespread acceptance and when opportunities that we could not even imagine today were born. So connecting with other like-minded advocates is really essential to recharging our batteries and refilling our reserves of energy and creativity.
energy that gets sorely depleted through the course of our day-to-day -day work. But this shared community must be paired with our willingness to continue to connect with those we haven't even yet met, because you never know where the next great idea will be generated, nor do we know which idea will catch on and really change the world. So I really do hope that some of you will choose to make animal law your career and your passion. There is so much work to be done, and frankly, we need you. So despite all the challenges, when I see the students of today, I feel very hopeful about the future. I feel like we're in very, very good hands. And I know that together we can make a world of difference for the animals that we love and care about. So I really thank you for your interest in this field, and I would be very happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much. I'm not a law student, but I'm trying to figure out how to integrate these things in my own life. You mentioned constitutional law previously. I'm wondering, and this is more of a 